what what is she let's say what is the position that the title of the book wants to differentiate itself from Meeting halfway is kind of compromise, so it's a compromise between maybe the mental and the physical. A compromise, a sort of a, a middle point between the mental and the physical. Well, a touching point. A touching point. That's nice, yes. Um, so, um, what does it mean? Well, where, where is halfway? Where is halfway? What does it mean to meet someone halfway? What does it mean? When you tell someone, I will meet you halfway. Because you're all the both moving. You are both moving, and you meet at the middle point. Yeah. yeah? Um, it's different from saying, you come to my house. Mm -hmm. Or it's different from saying, I come to your house. <coughs> yeah? So it's different from saying, I am a subject, and you are an object, and we are completely separate. Yeah? Here I am, I am a subject, here is an object, and I study it, or photograph it, or analyze it, and we are completely separate. I am not an object. Yeah? Why? Because I have consciousness. The object has no subjectivity. Why? Because it is a thing. Not a thinking thing, it's a thing. Yeah? So there is a complete divide between us, and thanks to the consciousness I was given, I can study this object. <coughs> so that's not meeting the universe halfway. That's holding the universe over there and studying it through a telescope or a microscope or whatever scope you might have. Yeah? That's one position. The other might be to say, we are all one. Me and this and the table and you and everyone, we are all one. There is no distinction between us. That, you know, um, so certain uh, mystical uh, teachings and certain philosophical teachings would um, take this point, this position quite seriously. So Barad, I just want you to get a clear idea of what is the title indicates. Barad says both these positions, they are, they have something in common. What they have in common is their inability to be two things at the same time. Yeah? So they are both, even though they are radically opposed, it's this oppos radical opposition that makes them quite similar. What, is, what they are unable to accommodate is intertwining, mingling, some kind of continuous contamination, continuous inf infiltration of the one into the other, which doesn't obliterate difference, but also doesn't establish absolute difference. Yeah? That's what meeting the universe halfway is recognizing that the scientific procedure is valid, not because it is objectively true, it's valid, however, it is not separate from the objective studies. Yeah? It is the same intertwined, interconnected process that contains within it the science and the sociology and the, and the culture uh, and the mind and the consciousness. So that's why um, Barad, I think we will see it more next week, proposes, suggests that we think about refraction rather than representation. And what is refraction? Do you know? Do you know refraction? Light bounces in the same way. You sometimes get it if you, for instance, scan a old negatives, scan negatives, and they get these kind of rings, you know, refraction rings, because there are air bubbles struck between, let's say, the film and the glass of the scanner, yeah, and you get kind of refraction. Well, like when you throw a pebble into the pond, and you get this sort of uh, ripples through the pond. Um, so that, for uh, Barad, is a much more interesting model to think about the way entities interact. Yeah, through continuous refraction. So that's, that's the sort of things uh, we're going to look at today. Uh, but before we get into all that, 
I wanted to uh, go back to the Schrodinger cat. <coughs> and I, I brought a, a picture which I think is a better explanation than the previous uh, one we looked at. This is from uh, Roger Penrose's book, The Emperor's New Mind. Uh, it's an interesting book with a very uh, interesting main thesis. In this book, Penrose argues that the mind is a quantum computer. That's his big thesis, that the mind is a quantum machine. Um, but that's not why I wrote it here. I thought, I thought that this, the illustration here is really uh, kind of, it's, it's, it's more explanatory. It's also so similar to what we, the way we understand photography to operate that I think it is quite, quite remarkable and kind of thought-provoking. So I just want to provoke these thoughts for another uh, few minutes, and then we'll go back to Parada. Uh, so, uh, so here we have the sealed room with a cat. And inside there is the observer in the biohazard suit, because we're going to here there is a uh, cyanide um, container. Yeah? And there in the top corner, uh, there is the flash that fires the single uh, photon. Now, the photon, you know, because it is neither, molecule, neither a particle nor a wave, but both, yeah, so think about the meeting the universe halfway, yeah? It's both things at the same time. It's both a wave and a particle, yeah? Um, so it's kind of statistically distributed throughout the room, yeah, but it's only one particle, yeah? Um, so only by passing through the mirror here, you see in the, in the core, in the top corner, but only, no, sorry, that's aperture. Only by passing through the mirror in the, on the top, on the left, um, the state of the particle is being determined, and then it either goes through. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to have the. Um. <clears throat> it will not go through. Um. Now, the whole point of the story is that for the observer inside the room, once the flash was fired, the state of the cat is clear, yeah? The cat will be either dead or alive. But for the person outside who has no access to the room, the, the cat is both dead and alive, yeah? And will be so until a measurement is taking place. It is the measurement that actually forces the cat to either be alive or the, the measurement. But, but the, the interesting point here is that we have here two people, you know, uh, person A inside the room, person B outside the room. And it seems that their reality is different in, their, in, in terms of the cat. Uh, so there is a kind of split. Now, is it possible to say that that's, in a sense, what always happens when we talk about photography? Because we could say that the, what, what this room is, is the, the film. The film in your camera. Let's just talk about the film now, and we can later speak about the, the light sensitive uh, deal. But with the film, as well, it's, it is in your camera, it gets exposed and then, the, and then sealed up in your film canister. And, and you don't know what is there. It is a latent image in complete darkness inside the... So as long as you didn't open this thing to take a look, to take a peek, the state of the image is exactly like the state of the cat. It's, it's undecidable. You really don't know what is there. So the only way to know is to take a peek. However, if you just open it to take a peek, the image disappears because it gets exposed by the light that comes through. So what you need to do is to pour in a chemical that develop, chemically develops um, the exposure and then makes it safe to view. After that is done, the image is fixed. Yeah? And it is either the dead cat or the alive cat. 
but for as long as you didn't develop the film, as long as it sits in your um, dark slide or in your film canister, exposed but undeveloped, it is very similar to that in the way it is undecided. Yeah? Which I think is quite interesting. It sort of suggests that this notion of undecidability is inherent in the photographic process. Yeah? We overcome it by developing the film. But in a sense, we also destroy something in doing that. Yeah? So why are we bothering to develop? Why is it not enough to leave the image later? So to answer that question, we need to think about vision and seeing and the value they attach to these qualities. Did I lose you here? No. Here. Okay. I don't know if it helps, but uh, it might make, make better sense once we compare this experiment with um, Barad. So, I wanted to look today at the second, or at the first chapter in this book, but the last time I wanted to the introduction, and that is called Reading the Universe Halfway, um, as the book itself. And um, <coughs> let's have a look here. Um, yeah, I want to read this paragraph that starts on page 40, and it is the last paragraph on the page. Can you see it like this? Can you see, is it clear? Um, so who could, uh, who could read to us? Look, thank you. <coughs> On the other hand, I stand in sympathy with my scientific colleagues who want science studies scholars to remember that there are cultural and natural causes for knowledge claims. While most constructivists go out of their way to attempt to dispel the fears that they are either denying the existence of a human independent world or the importance of natural, material, or non-human factors in the construction of scientific knowledge, the bulk of the attention has been on social or human factors. To be fair, this is where the burden of proof has been placed. Constructivists have been responding to the challenge to demonstrate the falsity of the worldview that takes science as the mirror of nature. Nonetheless, as both the range and sophistication of constructivist arguments have grown, the charge that they embrace an equally extreme position that science mirrors culture 
of being leveraged against them with increasing vigor. Let's stop here. I really just wanted the last <coughs> three sentences. So can you, can you uh, read again from, um, from constructivists have been responding? <coughs> constructivists have been responding to the challenge to demonstrate the falsity of the worldview that takes science as the mirror of nature. Nonetheless, as both the range and sophistication of constructivist arguments have grown, <coughs> the charge that they embrace an equally extreme position that science mirrors culture has been levied against them with increasing vigour. So what, what do you hear in these sentences? What do you hear? Kind of handle it some bit. Um, <coughs> This is similar to our Heidegger piece that we had when we looked at nothing, but the scientists constructed this uh, saying that the science doesn't explain everything. It's, uh, so there are two um, positions here. Why would you just to be very clear? I mean, we're not studying science. So we, were, we want to make a leap from this discussion to the things we are concerned with, which is the image. But I just want you to be clear about what is the main, where are the two main camps? In one camp, there is the approach that says science is a mirror of what? Nature. Nature. Of nature. In the other camp, what is the approach? Science is a mirror of culture. culture. Yeah? So some people say science objectively knows about the world out there. The others say science can only know about what's going on in my head. Does it make sense? Do you understand why? Yeah? What Varad is saying, not surprisingly, he says, you both need to wake up and smell the coffee. You both fall into the same trap of thinking in dualistic binary fashion. Yeah? Okay. What do you think? What can you take from this to think about art? Can we just schematically say that in the way people talk about our practice, this, this opposition is still sustained? It's the famous thing of life takes an art, life takes an art. It is this, yes. Uh, so, um, so you could say that there is, um, that's basically, you know, the, the kind of um, conversation in photography where the photographs are a reliable record of events and situations that happen out there, or if photography is personal expression. Yeah, some say people say, well, photography is just as subjective as any other uh, art form because there is always the person behind the camera. Yeah, so every picture, in a sense, is a self portrait. Yeah, and then the others will say, well, no, photography is the objective imprint of the real or something like that. Yeah. Now, what, what we, how, if we take this Barad way of thinking, we will be able to say with confidence that both of them are um, lacking. They are not their false opposites, because both of them begin from the notion of the subject. Yeah? Some say that the subject can know the world for what it is objectively. Others say no, the subject only can know what the subject is, but also objectively. And ultimately, none of them allows you to be in a place that questions why do we have the subject in the first place. In, you know, in, um, just so you will not, I don't want people to think that this is kind of abstract. The, the, the very direct um, poly, uh, policy driven implications from this way of thinking. Should, for instance, fine art students um, learn how to become cultural producers? Should we teach you how to um, make cultural objects, television programs, um, posters? Um, you know, should, should, should your education in art be oriented towards cultural production? Or should you just be um, encouraged to simply, you know, explore wherever the fans takes you 
and not uh, think at all about what you know the market or society might need. You know, um, these kind of questions you have to deal with uh, very often. And they are um, the answers to them have implications to the way education is organized and funded, and uh, what its purpose is supposed to be. So and that's where it is. Um, that's where the this form of talking about art takes its bearings. You are very quiet today. Are you okay? <laughs> um, okay. Right. Let's go to page for the sake. But I think that's maybe the So, okay, maybe that will uh, pique your interest. Um, from representationalism to performativity. Uh, before we begin, look, could you please read the epigraph from the verse? Um, as long as we stick to things and words, we can believe that we are speaking of what we see, that we see what we are speaking of, and that the two are linked. Okay, simple words, yeah. All the words are quite clear. What what this thought tells us? What what do you hear in the verse here? Anything unclear, anything unclear about this sentence? Any words you don't understand? What is it trying to say? Or how do you how do you understand? <coughs> Vicky, is it a hard question? Mm -hmm. And why is it, why is it, why, why is it a hard question? Because it's obvious. What? What he says? Yes, it's too obvious to... To even say it? So what, 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 what does it say? What is the obvious thing that it says? That when we say something, we know that we see it and we see what we say and it's just so our nature to have this. But, but, so why, is, why begins the sentence with as long? Because there's one option, there's no option. And what is the other option? The other option is not spoken. So what, what is the other option? Are you following? What is that of? Well, we don't think so words, there are thoughts. There are other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, things and words, or objects and pictures, yeah? It's, a, it's like saying, as long as we think about, um, as long as we stick to the idea of pictures and objects, pictures and things, in which pictures are representations of things and things are entities that can be pictured. As long as we stick to that formula, we will always find reassurance to it. We will always find that that's how it is. But at the same time, we will miss something else that is going to Is it what sort of being an echogen? It's, yeah, well, it's basically, if you are if you decide in advance that there are words and there are things, and for every thing there is a word, and for every word there is a thing, if you decide that in advance, you will always find more words and more things. And, and that, that's correct. But uh, you will always, you, you will, you, what you will never be able to experience is another way of being in the world. It's more difficult. Sorry? It's more di you have to go that you have to step out of the words and the things in order to find what is beyond them. 
You need to step out, you say. Or, or, or into. You have to embrace what's beyond it, and, where, and generally people are unsure of what's beyond the words and things. Oh, may well that that might be one way to step to step beyond, or perhaps to renegotiate what are words and what are things. Are words really that different from things? Uh, is there really a clear-cut distinction between them? That is the question. So. Okay, Luke, are you still okay to, uh, to read to us? Yeah. Can we start from the beginning, liberal, social? <coughs> liberal, social, and political theories and the theories of scientific knowledge alike owe much to the idea <coughs> the world is composed of individuals presumed to exist before the law or the discovery of the law, awaiting or inviting representation. The idea that beings exist as individuals with inherent attributes anterior to their representation is a metaphysical presupposition that underlies the belief in political, linguistic, and epistemological forms of representation. Okay, I'll stop here for a second. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, what does it say? Humanism or whatever um, makes the things on simple labels on things, <coughs> words on things, everything's defined and fixed and internalized and ignores you know, the fluidity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, how if we go back now to what Deleuze was saying? to separate words and things. Yeah? But you know, I often feel that it's actually on Monday during the install when we engage directly with theory. You know, when theory really is, becomes visible. And it often happens that these sessions, well, these sessions are designed to be practice sessions. Yeah? So it's just possible that the distinction is not things on the one side and words on the other, but that things and words have a way of continuously shaping and reshaping each other. And so I think what, what the verse is saying here is almost something I could take as a uh, motto for, uh, for the way we walk in an art school. So, Luke, can you read the next sentence that starts from four to put the point the other way around? Well, to put the point the other way around, representationalism is the belief an ontological distinction between representations and that which they support to represent. In particular, that which is represented is held to be independent of all practices of representing. 
That is, there are assumed to be two distinct and independent kinds of entities. Representation 